Um, so I want to welcome everybody. I am um, I'm Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colm Powell School. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us um, for what I know is going to be an important conversation. Um, so the Colm Powell School is the School of Social Sciences at City College. We're about 4,000 students and we're home to all parts of the social sciences, including the Department of Psychology, which supports on its own almost 1,500 undergraduate majors. Um, you know, across the Colm Powell School, we're very concerned with public problems. It's really what animates our work and with preparing the next generation of leaders. And in this moment, the problem that really is concerning us the most is in many ways how this pandemic is affecting our community, our students, our faculty, our staff, those in and around our community. Um, there is really kind of no question, I think, that the negative effects of this pandemic are affecting our community and especially our students disproportionately. New York City has been an epicenter for the pandemic and now as positive diagnoses and deaths are mapped by zip code in our city, we know that the neighborhoods where our students and their families live have been the places that have seen the most infections and the most deaths. If they haven't lost their jobs, then our students and their families are working in what are often dangerous conditions. The psychological, the economic, and the social traumas in our community are profound, and they require that we have an intensive conversation, and frankly, then more action by all of us to figure out how to help support our students and our faculty and our staff and this community through what is an incredibly difficult time. I'll give you just one example. Um, the Colm Powell School has a student emergency relief fund to help students who find themselves with unexpected financial need. We, we typically process about 25 emergency grant requests each semester. Um, so far in just the last eight weeks, we've processed 200 requests and we have more in the queue. Um, so we're, we're fortunate to have four members of our faculty who have agreed to join us in this conversation today and to share their own expertise as it pertains to some of the very subjects that, um, that I've introduced. Um, so let me just introduce them briefly, um, and then I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll speak, and they'll each take about five to seven minutes to share some thoughts, and then we want to open it up for discussion. Um, Sasha Rudenstein is an assistant professor of psychology at the Colorado um, School. Ariyinki Ankatsulari Smith is a professor of psychology at the Colm Powell School. Peter Frankel is an associate professor of psychology at the Colm Powell School. And Hillary Caldwell is an instructor in our Department of Political Science, but it turns out is actually also really a psychologist. Uh, so we are fortunate to have all four of them. Um, they're each going to make some opening remarks, and then I invite us to have a, an exchange and a, a chance to um, ask questions. Um, I'd ask you to all remain muted. I know it's now become fashionable and it's kind of strange for, for those of us who speak, but it's fashionable to not only mute, but now also I guess to have your camera off, which means you're kind of staring at a, a field of black or gray uh, rectangles. Feel free to turn your camera on because it is really <laughs> nice to see folks. Um, but, but if you don't mind muting yourself, that would be nice. And then as we get to questions, um, you can feel free to kind of signal over in the chat room to me that you have a question and I'll keep a cue um, and, and call on folks so that they can um, ask them. And last note, I just wanted to let folks know that we are recording the event so that we can post it. We had a lot of folks who wanted to attend but couldn't make it at this moment, so they'll be able to view it at a future point. So with that, let me turn it over to Sasha, who's going to start us off. Sasha there, do we lose her? We lost Sasha temporarily. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, you're so here, I, there you go. I don't know, but I'm gonna, so am I, Andy, I missed you. Can I log in to, and share my screen now? Yeah, you can. Okay. Uh, or I can share your slides for you if you want. Sure, I can. I got it now. Okay. So can everybody see the slides? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I really lost connection. Um, I'm really delighted to be part of this discussion. Um, and thank you, Dean Rich, for having me. Um, let me 
let me just try to explain a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. We set out over the last month to try to understand the CUNY student experience in the context of COVID. And similar to what Dean Rich just said, our students, because of their location in the epicenter of the pandemic, with the breadth of stressors that they're constantly sort of battling against, are really at a unique um, they're, they're much more vulnerable to the, to the consequences of the pandemic. And so there's a few truths that we know. The first being that COVID-19 doesn't discriminate. But the other truth is that the world around us, right, the politics, power, place, all these disparities sh that shape our lives have resulted in COVID-19 being particularly devastating for those communities and individuals with fewer resources, many of which are our students. And so in an effort to capture that reality, we set out to try to document and understand their um, exposure to COVID, the stressors they're facing, and the mental health sequelae. So over the past month, we've actually surveyed six CUNY campuses. And the data I'll present today is honing in on about responses from about 2,700 students across those six campuses. It's just the preliminary results. We just closed the survey a few days ago. But we're not only seeing what we would expect, but what we're finding is actually quite concerning and really lays out the need for us to think hard about how do we help the students and our community heal through this process. So first, just basically, again, the mean age of the CUNY sample is about 25 years old. 41% identifies Latinx very diverse, 22 I, are black, African-American, about 18% Asian. In terms of socioeconomic status, um, about a third of our students are saying that their own income is under 5,000 a year, with household incomes for a quarter of the students being under 35,000 a year. And when I say household, it's every, it's the composite of all the income in that home. So you know, 50% have a household income of up to 75,000. But again, if that's spread across three, four, five, six people, um, all of a sudden income to needs ratio really, um, they are fall within sort of a poverty level. And 50% of these students report some level of household debt. So that's just trying to set the landscape for who the students that respond to the su survey are, and what is their context coming into the pandemic? So we next tried to think about what really is their direct exposure with COVID. And we did that in two ways. First, trying to find out, have they been diagnosed with COVID-19? And about, of those that responded, almost 5% have personally been diagnosed by a medical professional, with 11% having somebody in their family diagnosed. I guarantee that underestimates the truth. Um, because many people we now know are asymptomatic. And we also know many people have mild to moderate cases that don't require medical attention and never are diagnosed. And testing has been so limited that we don't know the breadth of actually the number of cases. So this is of just those that have actually received a diagnosis. 40% of our students are expressing this intense concern about getting contracting coronavirus. So that's just the exposure. And so now what, what does that do to us? How does that change how we behave? And so we could say we're kind of relieved that to some extent, most of our students are following medical and public health advice. 79% are saying they're wearing a mask. They're washing their hands more often than they normally do. Social distancing. So there, that all is sort of, we're, they're following the directions that we're all getting. That said, there's also a number of behaviors that are more associated with mental health concerns. 62% are eating more or less than normal. And changes in appetite and sleep are indicators of mental psychological distress. 79% are sleeping more or sleeping less. 60% are exercising less. That could be as much psychological as it is also we're isolating indoors, resources, parks are closed, et cetera. 
In terms of substance use, I didn't put it on this slide, but it's really quite interesting that our students are reporting the same or less cigarette, marijuana, and alcohol use than is normal for them. My hunch is that's both um, financial and access purposes, but we're not seeing a spike in substance use that we often will see associated with mental illness or mental dis psychological distress. So we've now talked about right, the direct exposure, we have the behaviors, but there's all this trickle down effect of the stressors that COVID is creating for all of us. And we try to understand what is that for our students. So nearly a quarter of our students report a death of a close friend or family member due to COVID-19. That's a, that's a really large percent. A uh, third are having increased family relation pro relationship issues. A quarter have lost their job. And then 50% are reporting financial difficulties and 30% not able to pay their rent. Um, and so what we know about stressors is each stressor makes us more vulnerable for psychological distress. The accumulation of stressors it makes that vulnerability exponential. And 50% of our students who re responded report at least five unique stressors. So they're not just having one of these things, they're having all five plus others that we inquired about. So, so this, this slide and the next two are trying to actually map on this relationship between stressors and three different diagnoses of um, first anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress symptoms. And what we found is exactly as we would expect, that the more stressors, the more likely the student is to have anxiety, to have depression, and to have symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So that is completely in line with what we would think going into it, and we're finding it um, amongst our students. Interestingly, when we asked our students just to subjectively think, how would they rate their mental health right now? 42% rate it as either fair or poor, and that's compared to good or excellent. So there's a self-awareness of angst, of sadness, of anxiety within them. So the other piece that we were able, we've been able to do and is kind of is unique is that the survey we used for the, our CUNY survey is the exact same survey that a colleague of mine used, <clears throat> excuse me, nationally. And so we've been able to think about how are things looking for the CUNY community as compared to a national community, both going through uh, COVID, one going through COVID in the epicenter of COVID in the United States, and also compound that with being a much more under-resourced uh, population. So what this shows, and I'll walk us through it, is looking at depression severity, across different community, different samples. So if you look at this column here, my cursor is sort of circling, it says national sample before COVID. So this is a national sample collected in 2017. 74% report no depression. 17% report mild, and then 9% in this moderate to moderate severe group. Now we look at a national sample just three weeks ago, so during COVID, and all of a sudden we drop, right? Only 50% have no depression. Our mild is at 26, and we're at about 25% moderate to severe. But now we look at CUNY students, and all of a sudden we're at 50% nearly, our moderate to severe depression, 31 mild, and only 20% are reporting no depression at all. So combined our geographic location, with the impact of stressors, with a lack of resources, and we're seeing this sort of uh, spike, right, in depression. And similarly, we see it with um, anxiety. And I don't have a pre-COVID for anxiety, but in terms of a national versus CUNY, it's a similar trend. We go from right, approximately 35 with no anxiety to only 27 with none. And in terms of moderate severe, about 30% moderate to severe, 
to all of a sudden 40% moderate to severe anxiety. And so, you know, this is really a snapshot. Um, there's so much more that we're examining and trying to make sense of, but it's a very uh, coherent picture. Um, it's clear and it's telling us that there's a fair amount of psychological suffering within our students. There's a huge amount of need. And so the questions that, you know, I'm asking is now as a community, what do we do to kind of fill, fill in that gap and how do we help? And I really look forward to the discussion we're going to have and to hear from the rest of my colleagues and hope that we can kind of grapple with this a little bit because I think that as Dean Rich said, the action kind of needs to start now. So thank you. And I hope I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Sasha, that was great. Thank you very much for sharing this. And it's a first look at, at some new data. Um, now I want to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Yinka. I have to unmute myself, I forgot. So again, thank you so much, very much for having us. Um, I'm gonna add to the conversation, but shift it a little sideways. Uh, we've been talking a lot about essential workers during this pandemic. And when we think and talk about such workers, the conversation typically revolves around our heroic medical providers, the EMTs, the transit workers, the police, the firefighters. And these are people who have carried us during these very strange and dark times, um, critical and essential members of our community who we're all so very grateful to. However, what I'd like to do is highlight another type of essential worker, uh, the ones that we don't hear much about, the ones we don't discuss, and when we do, the conversation from our government is really has been around the blame game or shutting them out, shutting them down. Um, and in order to highlight this type of essential worker, I'd like those of us participating in the Zoom meeting, in this Zoom meeting, to think about just for one second about the following types of workers. And these are workers who my colleague, Dr. Hawthorne Smith, who is the director of the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture has highlighted. So think about essential workers. Who picks the majority of the fresh produce that makes it to our tables in this country, right? Who is being forced to work in our meat factories without the necessary precautions uh, so that Americans have their protein? Who is driving our Uber or Lyft when we have no choice but to come into the city? Um, who is preparing and delivering our food as we wait in isolation? Um, who is stocking our grocery stores? Who is sitting with and caring for our elders as home health aides uh, when we're not even able to visit them? Um, who do we see on the subways, or on the bus routes, when we, some of us are forced to communicate, communi communi bleh, commute ourselves, right? So in COVID-19 hotspots, like our great state of New York, um, immigrants make up over 22% of the population. So through the work that my colleagues and I have done at the, uh, continue to do with the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture, we have the privilege of providing services to immigrant populations, particularly refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented people who come to our country fleeing armed conflict, persecution, human rights violations, and many of these live in our community here in Harlem. This population of forced migrants who have already been traumatized and often come to this country seeking safety and a better way of life are often marginalized, uh, vulnerable, and practically invisible, but yet they're still taking significant risks to provide services that are central to our viability. Um, and many of them who we are seeing in our program are struggling with the issues that, you know, Sasha pointed out that our students are. Um, death of family members, death of community members, uh, illness, um, losing jobs, losing, uh, you know, accommodation, um, you know, financial distress, all of these adding to stressors that they are already facing. So the challenge, you know, again, to kind of piggyback off what Sasha is saying is, like many of our students, this population who is within our community faces these struggles. And we also have to think about how we are going to extend and expand our responses to these challenges. And I'm gonna stop there and give the others their space. And I guess we'll have a multi-log from here on. 
Great, thank you very much. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, Dean Rich uh, said, well, as I said, thanks so much for organizing this and to my wonderful colleagues. Um, you know, Sasha's data, uh, I think, really illustrates a point that I want to make. I'm a specialist in couple and family functioning uh, and systemic therapy. And of course, uh, Yinka, Dr. Yinka's uh, uh, experiences also uh, talk about how the social context, including um, the political context, of course, but economic housing and so forth, affect individual symptomatology. We have to remember that that is a major factor here. <clears throat> and the comments I'm gonna make, of course, um, apply to our whole community to our staff, to our faculty, and to our students. Uh, one of my wonderful undergraduate uh, honors thesis students, Mariana Adiep, just uh, completed her thesis on um, female students, undergraduates mostly, who are also mothers. Um, so I'll be talking quite a bit today about some of the work family balance issues, which is something that I write about uh, uh, quite a bit. And of course, our, our students uh, mostly live with their families. They're not and they don't have the means and often don't want to for all sorts of reasons uh, to live alone um, or uh, with peers. So, you know, we really have to think about what's going on inside families right now. So let me make a few comments about that. First of all, um, there are massive changes in daily rhythms of being together and being apart. Uh, on the positive side, parents and kids have more opportunity to have meals together, play, uh, parents are helping uh, kids with their schoolwork and so forth. On the downside, parents have other obligations, um, often work. Um, uh, and teens are at a stage when, you know, they turn to their peer group and want to spend a little less time uh, with their families and differentiate from their parents. So this is creating uh, pandemics and quarantine is creating a struggle there. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about what's going to happen when things uh, return to, I won't quite say normal, but some assembly of that. Um, young kids who may have already uh, had some temperament attachment uh, issues around separation, that whole um, overcoming of that, of that problem, which most kids do, uh, is in a sense being delayed right now because they're not going to school and getting through that, um, that phase. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see actually a greater rate of separation anxiety uh, with kids who hadn't had an opportunity to kind of practice being apart from parents. Couple sex lives and other adult intimacy activities are also being disrupted, uh, especially if they've worked out a routine of sending the kids to the grandparents or the auntie, you know, for a few hours on the weekend. And that is, you know, reducing uh, the connection between parents, which they need so much right now to cope with, uh, and the good feeling to, to cope with uh, all the challenges. Um, <clears throat> for adults also, loss of regular socializing with colleagues and friends, which normally decreases the burden on the partner, right? Um, and also the loss of kind of uh, positive reinforcement for, for their work in the workplace. Uh, so the sort of balance of reinforcers for work versus home activity is, is kind of being skewed quite a bit. Then there's, you know, longstanding, I've written a lot about uh, telecommuting and many people have written about uh, the challenges of telecommuting and I have uh, a little bit of a lighthearted illustration of that that I can show you. Let's see if this works. Uh, I found this uh, on the internet. This is uh, um, a American political scientist uh, being interviewed by the BBC and in the middle of the interview, well, at the beginning of the interview, um, let me see if I get this on. His kids want to happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your is important. I mean, shifting, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. Uh, um, sorry. Okay. My Okay, so uh, let me get back on the screen here. Hold on a second. Just so you know, it did, Peter, for whatever reason, it didn't come through as a screen share, so we could hear it, but we couldn't see it. Oh, I wonder Sorry, why. Okay, well, it basically showed a, a, a political scientist being interviewed by the BBC about 
very serious stuff about North Korea, and all of a sudden his little kids come wandering in, one in a, you know, like a rolling thing, and the other just making lots of faces. And let's not forget, this is a, a privileged white individual with a big study, apparently. I think the challenge is for many of our students um, and, and staff, you know, given what, uh, what we talked about, economic constraints and so forth, they're living in very cramped quarters a lot. Um, and so those parents who are trying to work from home, telecommute, um, and you know, they're not having the usual kind of nanny support or external uh, child care. So it's making uh, things quite, uh, quite challenging. Um, you know, uh, I've written a lot about dual earner couples, uh, and there's a lot of uh, arguments cropping up, as you can expect, about who gets the most time to do their work, and then what gets uh, energized in those, or revealed in those kind of arguments is uh, gender power dynamics, often in heterosexual couples, uh, or income, like I make the most income, or my job is the most important, uh, I have the most responsibility, so you need to understand kind of arguments. And that's for uh, couples of any uh, sexual orientation and so forth. So a lot of struggles with that. In my practice, I'm seeing that quite often. I also work a lot with what I've written about as last chance couples. These are couples who are already on the brink of divorce and in some cases already separated. And now they're all together. So there's typically high conflict. And this can become an impetus to finally put into practice some of the kind of cognitive behaviorally oriented uh, communication techniques and problem solving skills that I might have instructed them in. Uh, but mm, depending on the level of, uh, of um, you know, commitment to making things uh, go better, they may do it and they may not. All another topic is, and I work with a lot as couples where there's an affair. So now partners are uh, together all the time and suddenly there's a text on someone's phone from a lover so you can imagine uh, some of the challenges that are going on there. For kids, just briefly uh, talk about kids, of course there's a loss of physical play time, in-person play, exercise of the sort that kids get into. Those kids are not like you know um, doing P90X and uh, the treadmill. Their exercise comes from social activities. Um, and their, act, their fun activities, as we all know from being kids and watching our kids, often start with a tag kind of thing or some kind of a physical gesture. So uh, all that has been um, eliminated now. And uh, play is so important, not just on the physical level, but on the social developmental level. Uh, kids are scared. Everybody is pretty scared right now. Um, Dysregulated, as we would say in psychology, or as Elliot Juris, one of our uh, uh, clinical uh, faculty might say, they're having difficulty modulating uh, their uh, emotions um, uh, in this, as we all are, but kids are particularly at risk in that. Um, and then, of course, it's been briefly mentioned, dealing with illness and loss of a family member, neighbor, friend, work colleague, and the trauma you know, many people are experiencing actual, as Sasha sort of alluded to, uh, PTSD uh, symptoms, uh, if not the full-blown diagnosable disorder, then certainly elements thereof. So I just wanna wrap up with a few solutions. I've been doing some podcasts and doing some writing about some of this um, in my field. First of all, that old saying, and I actually this morning tried to find who said it first, who knows, flexibility is the key to mental, and I would add relational health. <clears throat> What that, is, what that means is lowering standards for home cleanliness and organization. This is kind of a messy time. Um, being gracious, um, showing more compassion, slowing down when there's a difficulty between partners or between a parent and a child, and really slowing the pace of talking. We can't rush through these things. We never could. But at this point, with all the stressors, slowing down, taking it easy, trying to... Um, be compassionate with one another and families is so important. And if you happen to have learned communication, problem solving skills, as all my students do in my courses, uh, this is a good time to use them. Um, finding other forms of entertainment. I have a colleague, narrative therapy colleague in Istanbul, who um, uh, interviewed kids um, both in Istanbul and also had some Aboriginal um, um, persons in Australia interview kids their suggestions 
about what parents could best do for them, but also for themselves. It's a wonderful document. I think I sent it to you, Dean Rich, and we could distribute it. It's really quite lovely. Um, and you know, one of the main things kids say was basically in their own way, and these are little kids, some of them, five, six years old, slow down, play with us more, don't get so stressed out, things like that. So there's wisdom in the voice of the child. Um, one of the things that research has demonstrated, very simple activity, but um, couples sometimes don't do it, which is um, showing daily appreciation and even admiration for one's partner, for one's kid. That is, um, and it fits with positive psychology too, the notion of saying something that you appreciate about how each other is handling uh, this situation and in general. And I think very importantly, many people are talking about this, this is a time for all of us and for families and couples, communities to think about what matters most. You know, we, we're not able to go out and do exciting things. We're probably a bit more limited, most of us, and certainly people in the lower uh, socioeconomic strata uh, around buying things and spending money. It's a time to really think about what matters most. This is an existential moment in our society with families and individuals. And we have to really think about what does our existence mean? And if that means reaching to spiritual or religious beliefs and practices, that can be a good thing for those who, uh, uh, who are engaged in those ways of, of being. Um, it's very important, I'll wrap up in one minute here, to um, create regular daily routines of work, schoolwork, parent-child time, meals, and bedtime for kids. I did a lot of research over the years with families in homeless shelters and found that that was one of the major sources of resilience. When families had more, kept regular routines, even though they were displaced uh, housing-wise, uh, those kids were better regulated, they had less behavioral disturbances and so forth. So creating regular rhythms uh, in the day uh, is, is very, very important uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, mindfulness practices, um, with little kids, I do super slow breathing, super slow superhero walking. I have a little video on that. I can send to Dean Rich as well. Um, kids find it fun, and it's very helpful for just bringing down the sympathetic nervous system around. So it's a very nice thing to do as a family, and it is part of creating the sort of um, culture of calmness and compassion that we need so much right now. Tech often intrudes on relationships, but right now, even as we speak, um, technology is is really uh, helping us stay connected. You know, I, I read somewhere a critique of this term social distancing. It really is a problematic term. So uh, I, I came up with my own little acronym, which is PDESC, which is physical distancing and enhanced social connection. Yes, we do need to keep physical distance, but we don't need to keep social distance. And technology helps with that. It's very important. You know, the major finding in so many studies uh, is uh, about how we are resilient in the face of trauma, resilient in the face of disaster and so forth, is social support. We have to maximize social support. We have to be physically distant, but we can have enhanced uh, social connection. Um, don't watch uh, TV or particularly your computer or your phones and have to help kids not do that too too late because the research shows that the blue light is very practical, but I talk about this all to my clients, very practical advice. Blue light, um, um, it suppresses the melatonin, melatonin, which is essential to sleep. So I recommend that you get one of these blue light glasses and they also have them for computer screens. They cut out 98% of the blue light, it will um, help not reduce sleep so much uh, and so forth. Uh, couples need to come up with a fair, equitable distribution of time in terms of uh, their work responsibilities, housework and so forth. Your research forever has shown that even in dual earner couples, women and heterosexual couples do two to three times, used to be three to four, it's gotten better for the younger generation, two to three times as much housework and childcare this is a time to re-examine that uh, and you know, change that into a more equitable um, uh, a pattern. Uh, for last chance couples, I've been really urging them not to make big decisions at this time. 
and to really sort of bring themselves together to help their kids themselves. And then finally, um, dealing with loss. Um, two of my students, three of my students had a, had a, fa a family member die. Uh, one uh, person uh, got, their, their, their grandparent died just the day before she was to present in class. The other was finishing her thesis while her father was getting sick. So we have to, this is a very, very painful and serious time. And, you know, we've read a lot about how people aren't even able to bury their deceased um, uh, family member. So coming up with, sadly, with alternatives, rituals that will honor them and honor the family's loss. So thanks. I uh, hope some of that was interesting and useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and, and lastly, let's hear from uh, Hillary Caldwell. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be with you. Um, yeah, so I teach for in a program called the Minor in Community Change Studies. It's a relatively new minor at the that's centered at the Colin Powell School. And um, it's it's great to have a chance to connect with some of you who I haven't before. So uh, what I'd like to share is a little bit from uh, of my own research, which is centered on struggles over land and housing in New York City, as well as uh, some of the research that my students and I have been doing about those same struggles among CUNY students. So uh, I'm teaching uh, community-based research this semester uh, at City, as well as an internship seminar with students that are currently placed in internships with community-based groups working on housing, uh, and food insecurity. Uh, and together, between my teaching and my own personal research, I, you know, I have the opportunity to see a lot of the problems up close, but also in particular the response. So I thought I would focus some of my comments today on uh, what the response, the community-based response, is looking like to the COVID pandemic. Um, the, from the, the other speakers, we heard in even greater detail um, what some of the impact of the pandemic is on our students and on the communities that our students are all part of, as well as communities that we're part of as, as faculty and staff. Uh, and I could certainly speak more to that. The only thing I would, I would say before speaking about some of the collective responses to the pandemic um, is that there, in a lot of my research and my students' research is focused on a lack of attention to the basic needs and security of students, of CUNY students, on an ongoing basis. So pre-COVID, basic needs and security among our students was a huge problem. In fact, it's higher, we have higher rates of basic needs and security than comparable uh, households in New York City because students are in school. Their, their incomes are less than if they were working more. And as we all know, uh, financial aid doesn't pay the rent, right? It doesn't fill the gap that most students experience. So we have students that are working many jobs, taking care of family and trying to go to school. And it's a commuter campus, so they're doing this from all over the city. Now we have COVID that's hitting their, those same communities the hardest. And so we all know that it's just um, that we're, you know, we're getting slammed, right? And so I won't speak much more to that because I think we know it, you know, and it's maybe we don't need to say, I don't need to add to that. But I do just want to say that, you know, I'm hopeful that maybe this crisis is going to call you know, force us to, to see more clearly the pre-existing basic needs and security and uh, that, uh, you know, set us up for this to be as bad as it is. So we have quite a lot of data on this problem. Uh, it's not really a matter of not knowing that it's a problem. I think in part, we, the issue we have sometimes at CUNY is that we just accept it as fact that our students are poor and you know, are, are housing insecure and food insecure. In other cases, I think we're not 
fully aware because we can't fully take on, we, we can't always know the full extent of all the problems and always deal with it. But we do have quite a lot of data um, from the uh, HOPE Center for College Community and Justice out of Temple University, uh, does an annual survey of basic needs and security. And we have um, data that CUNY from the CUNY School of Public Health that has shown us over and over again how bad these problems are among our students. Okay, so putting that aside, um, I study housing and land and community-based organizing in New York and I teach it to our students. And right now is a really interesting time for this kind of work, for community-based work. And by, by community organizing, I mean, you know, the approach to change that really prioritizes the people most affected by the issue as the experts and the leaders of, uh, of the problems and, in, and of, of the solutions, right? And so prior to COVID, we have had, we have a rich, dense, sophisticated network of community-based organizations that have been working to address basic needs and security among uh, communities across the city, including those that our students live and work in. Uh, John Krinsky, who's a professor at City College um, out of uh, political science, he and I recently wrote an article um, about the landscape of organizing in New York City prior to COVID and now with COVID. So I'll just highlight some of the key points that we've made just to give you a sense of what we're seeing in terms of how the, the pandemic is affecting the landscape of organizing in the city. Um, and the way that we have uh, conceptualized this is really through um, identification of networks. So prior to COVID, uh, New York City had in recent years seen uh, a greater coordination among community-based or organizations in different parts of the city and across New York State, uh, working more closely together, not just um, within issue areas like housing or homelessness or food or immigration uh, or policing, but across issues. So increasingly we're seeing groups working more closely together across neighborhoods, across the city, across the state, and across issues. This is a really big deal. This is something that you know, people who study social movements are always saying we need more of. And we've done a pretty careful analysis uh, to show that this has really been happening pretty much since, uh, you know, you, we, there were some uh, critical moments where we've seen this happening more and more since Occupy Wall Street, uh, since, uh, the Communities United for Police Reform Coalition was organizing in full force around stop and frisk in New York. Um, and in more recent years, uh, around housing in particular and the rent reforms that we saw come into play last year. So we're, we were already seeing a lot of this happening uh, prior to COVID. What we're seeing now is an even greater intensification of the relationships between different groups. Uh, working more closely together, we're seeing constant town halls and uh, coordinated actions and advocacy um, among groups. I had uh, just one slide that I wanted to show of just a diagram that, um, that we, that shows our, uh, I'll see if I can get it up. It was uh, giving me some trouble earlier. This is just a diagram of movement networks, uh, seven coalitions in New York City, including CUNY Rising, uh, the CUNY Rising Alliance, uh, Public Bank Coalition, Housing Justice for All, Right to Counsel, New York City, New York Immigration Coalition, Communities United for Police Reform, and the New York City Community Land Initiative. So these are groups working on housing, um, education, public education, uh, policing, uh, banks, and more than that, uh, immigration. So here you have the red dots are organiz individual organizations, the blue squares are coalitions, and this diagram just shows how much overlap there is among these. This was not the case 
you know, most of these are new coalitions. These coalitions didn't even exist. Except, uh, most of them didn't exist 10 years ago or even five years ago. So this is really exciting. John Krinsky and I can hardly keep up with the relationships that are at play. What's also really exciting is that most of these groups are organizing for structural change, for more resources to go to meeting the needs that we know uh, exist at the same time as they're providing mutual aid. So in terms of meeting those direct immediate needs that so many people are facing right now in New York, we're seeing many of these groups often for the first time engaging in direct aid. So we're seeing a diversification of their own practices so that they're not just protesting or they're not just having a town hall or just working on legislation. They're also directly meeting the needs of their community members and they're working together to do so. And one great resource that I would share uh, on this front, can you see this now, the mutual aid? Great. So I just want to share this for anyone who um, is interested, who has needs, who knows someone who has needs. This is a really excellent resource called Mutual Aid NYC, uh, a network of groups that is providing direct aid and relief to the most vulnerable. Uh, and it provides, the idea of mutual aid is it's not charity, right? It's about giving what you can, getting what you need, and it is really meant to empower everyone involved. The idea is not that some have power and others don't, or you're helping out people who are powerless. It's really about people giving what you can, getting what you need. There are uh, groups providing mutual aid in every single part of New York City. There's a map here that contains, uh, that shows where you can click on uh the the neighborhood wherever you are and find groups that are providing mutual aid in that neighborhood you can also search by borough in this resource library so i encourage everybody just to check this out it's a great way to find out where you can plug in if you have anything to offer in terms of time resources it's also a place where you can go and you can direct students to go if they have needs that aren't being met because we know that's true and we know that these needs are not, um, you know, the, the emergency relief is not reaching uh, everyone. And the mutual aid network has, is really intentionally trying to reach those that are excluded and otherwise left out. And what's really wonderful about it is the connections between these groups um, involved in mutual aid and those that are doing the organizing to affect the structural change are very close. These, uh, the work is really integrated. And so by participating in mutual aid, it also becomes an opportunity to, you know, become more politically educated about, you know, why we're seeing what we're seeing and how to be involved in things beyond, you know, meeting immediate needs, but also the campaigns and the organizing that are going on more broadly. So, you know, as, as upsetting as, as everything is right now, um, in, in Professor Krinsky's and my analysis, we're really hopeful. We see the movements that we're part of and that we study becoming stronger now. They're becoming stronger in the face of this challenge. And you know, our work uh, on campus is really about connecting students to these, uh, you know, learning from these groups and from this work and connecting them directly. And so I um, am, am glad to see that. And I feel, I feel motivated that our students are are in many cases leaders in some of these community-based efforts. So I, that's enough to keep me going <laughs> in all of this. And that's, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. That's great. Hillary, thank you very much. And I want to, I want to, you showed us several really important slides, including the website, but you didn't show us your program website. And I just want students oh. who you now have heard about this phenomenal program to know that through the Colin Powell School website, you can navigate to the program and community change. And I encourage you to look at it because it really does, um, position students with training to become organizers and um, movement leaders in their communities. Um, and it's quite exciting. So we want to open it up for questions. Um, and so if you have a question, you're, you're welcome to signal so that over in the chat, um, or, you know, as long as we don't have too many people talking at once, you can just unmute yourself and, 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 and please feel free to ask your question. And I also want to invite each of the panelists 
if you'd like to ask questions of each other as it makes sense. If we don't have one straight out of the box, I will, I, I will ask um, one, but let me pause for just a minute in case anybody wants to, to go ahead. Um, and yeah, this is, hi, Celia, yeah. hi. Yeah. Andy, I think about, thank you so much for, um, thank you so much for the presentations and for doing this. I think about those in our community who may live in abusive situations, for whom coming out to school, for instance, right? For whom being on site would be a temporary relief from their situations. Have we captured them in our study and what we, how we envision um, being able to assist them? Is that clear? So, so if, um, because that's coming up a lot in my communities at CUNY where students are, they may be, people may be in abusive situations and coming out to school, for instance, leaving the house for a couple of hours a day would, is some kind of relief, albeit temporary. And how do we, how do we um, see supporting them or where are they in this research? Yeah. So I'm happy to try, we don't, we didn't assess directly any, um, sort of violence within the home. Mm -hmm. That said, right, we did find a huge increase in family relationship tensions and issues and difficulties. And so it's very likely that that's capturing a little of what you're speaking to, right? Yes. Um, it's challenging because on one level, we're all being told, stay home. Stay exactly in the place where we don't feel safe. Right. Um, and so, you know, as I think there's two levels, and I think, and I agree people's thoughts on it. On one hand, it, as long as we're in this level of crisis, where really for the sake of reducing the infection, we need to stay home, then it's about how do we provide some psychological services to individuals in their home. Mm -hmm. And how do we reach out more to provide skills and normalizing and really acute stress reaction work? Mm -hmm. In the, as we slowly open our doors, which will be slow and it's going to be done in some creative fashion, as my guess, then it's a matter of thinking about how do we try to create some safe space for individuals to have that refuge. Um, and thinking about that as possibly as important as attending, creating the space for students to come for their lab or for their class, right? So how do we allow our campus to potentially continue to be that place of refuge? Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that comes to mind, thinking about what Hillary was just speaking about, is that we are not the only resource, right? Yeah. So the more that we can help our students identify organizations possibly closer to their home that could either help meet the psychological ramifications of their experience, the real physical potentially mm -hmm. concerns that they're facing, but then also give them places to go without having to maybe commute by subway or bus that's closer or other options. So, you know, um, I do think we have to be creative in thinking about this in multiple stages of what can we do right now and what do we do slowly over time as life hits a new normal where movement yet is yet again part of our daily experience. I don't know if that's helpful. It, it is, it is. I, Thank you. Uh, so I actually, my students and I from City worked for 14 years in, uh, in a domestic violence shelter uh, for families who are homeless, part of the Help USA uh, network. And um, I, I'm part of an interdisciplinary group led by Dr. Jack Saul, who Lincoln owns, um, is the director of the International Trauma Studies Program. We've been meeting for a month and a half now, talking about all sorts of community-based uh, interventions, materials, short videos, and so forth. And in one discussion that we had a few weeks ago, this topic of really a, a pandemic 
of domestic violence um, across the country, in fact, across the world uh, right now. And, you know, we started thinking about, like, again, the model of preparing some materials that could be made public and so forth. And I really caution people with the following scenario. A, a woman um, on, on um, the computer looking at something about domestic violence and then her violent partner or other family member walking by and saying, what are you looking at? And um, there's, uh, as we say in psychology, the potential for iatrogenic effects, that is that something that was intended to be helpful could actually lead to an escalation. So it's very, very complicated. I looked into this, you know, after our conversation with this, this um, working group, I called one of my closest colleagues, uh, Dr. Sandra Stiff, who's one of the experts on couple therapy uh, for domestic violence. She said she's in Manhattan, Oklahoma. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a Manhattan, Oklahoma, the professor at the University of Oklahoma. She said, just as is true here, the shelters are full up. There's actually often some violence going on uh, among uh, shelter uh, um, residents. It's a very dire situation. So, boy, I wish there was some, you know, as Sasha's saying, it's, it's very delicate, you know, and mm -hmm. we feel we want to do something, you know, and this is, you know, in, in some of the most serious cases, probably not going to be so helpful, but some of the suggestions I made earlier about basically our prevention level, like how do we encourage families? How do we, as CUNY and City College, get mm -hmm. uh, the word out about what you can do as a family, as a person, as a couple to deal with this, um, deal with your stress, you know, stress management, simple things like breathing, simple things like couple communication skills to have s some impact at least on some possible instances of domestic violence here. That, that is, if, if people, because unfortunately mo most of the DV that happens is heterosexual men, and um, they're often in an earning capacity of some sort, now they've lost their job, and they don't know how to sort of handle that. So I think if we can promote primary prevention sorts of skills right now, it'll reach some percentage, but by no means is it gonna erase this problem. This is a long-term gender power-based issue that feminists like myself have been struggling with for years and my colleagues at the Ackerman Institute. It's, it's very, very upsetting and, and scary to think about women and kids in violent uh, families. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for raising that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Celia. You. Yeah, great. Um, we have a question in the chat space from uh, Professor Fuentes. Um, and she's asking, she has a question for uh, Professor Rudenstein, wondering whether in your findings from the survey, um, you are able to see differences by gender and by race. Sorry, there you go. All right, that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes. The answer is I need another few days. We. Um, so we will start, I think, teasing it apart in just that way, both by gender, by race. I wanna look, we're gonna look at zip codes. So, cause we actually have the zip codes of each of our respondents. So we could start to see differences throughout the New York City area. Um, other groupings that we wanna try to sort of start to tease apart is between campuses to actually also then get feedback to each campus that participated so they can think about their student body. Um, so all of that, I'll have a whole lot more and I'm so sorry in the next couple days, please email me. I'm happy to share um, and sort of disseminate it as I have it. Um, and and I sh it's absolutely an important direction to take the work. Okay, great. Um, we have another question um, on the chat space from Joy Richard. She, she said, in light of the changing family relationships, financial instability, and heightened rate of anxiety and stress among our students across the state. Um, how can we more effectively prepare for the majority of our incoming students academically and psychologically who have not made attachment connections yeah. with members of our community? Okay. So, so preparing for new students, particularly it seems both in light of the pandemic but also 
um, perhaps with an expectation that we won't be able to do normal new student orientations and they won't be able to kind of acclimate in a normal sense or an ordinary sense to the campus. Anyone with thoughts on that? I mean, I would kind of say just as we're doing now, while a lot of people are zoomed out, um, you know, it's one way to reach out to help them begin to create a community with us here prior to coming in would be a place to start. So can I ask the panel kind of as an extension of that, and it, it, it maybe it's building on the questions we're already asking, but yeah, what, what, what would each of you say should be the institutional response? Because, you know, I started as Dean, I guess, a little more than a year ago and have been here before and so have long had a, an attachment to City College, but particularly from this perch, there's always this sense that we're, there's, we're just not doing near enough. Our students' needs are extraordinary, even in more ordinary times. I have a, I have a, a suggestion. So no. I want, hi, professors. Uh, Theodore Vanessa here. I'm from the Colin Bauer psychology major. Um, so I was seeing on Instagram that you guys have like a class of 2024. Who's checking up on that? Is it just USG people that are doing it or CUNY Towers that are doing it? This is NY Towers. Following up on the question, how could we do more to like get the, the new student engaged being that it's COVID and they, it's going to be like a weird, um, because we can't really give them a tour of the school. We can't really give them uh, a tour of the dorms. We can't. So they are posting. I see them posting like, like I'm I'm planning on majoring in 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 psychology, or I'm planning on being like a medical student. And they're so cute. They're like they're like just graduating, like 17, just graduating, and they've made CD their first choice. So when I can, I reply like, "Welcome to the City College family," um, stuff like that, like. Right. No, I, I, hear, I hear what you're asking. Yeah. yeah. But faculty wise, like, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Because I'm not a faculty. I'm just a student. Just as them. Well, it's good that you're doing your part and we appreciate it. And I, I think part of it is what technology makes possible for us. We're doing institutionally, we're doing a lot of the same things. None of it feels like enough. Um, but but certainly it's, it's, it's what we can be doing at this point. And I, yeah, I think it kind of it adds to this question as to, you know, institutionally, how should we be engaging within the constraints we're faced with, both with the pandemic and frankly, the, the resources we have as an institution? I mean, it's an interesting thing you're doing, Vanessa, and lovely, really. And maybe, uh, Dean Rich, we could think about uh, kind of along the lines also of Hillary's comments about community action, that the alumni, recent alumni, um, take a role here. So we, we contact the alumni and see if they could each take five incoming students and call them and see how they're doing and stuff like that. I think it's, you know, I think we institutions often wait <laughs> until alumni become wealthy enough, you know, to contribute a little bit of money, to be frank. Um, but this is a time to contribute social resources, which are much more important. I think it's a lovely idea. And Vanessa, thanks for doing what you're doing. Cool. You're welcome. We we'll try. I think it is. And Andy, um, just Andy, I think that's probably that's probably a place where our committee can can do some more thinking around that. So right now, in in my space in student affairs and enrollment management, we're bringing students in. We um, we're advising them. We the um, there's an online advising and orientation component to it. But what I'm hearing is how do we how do we blend the transactional with the rela relational? And I think when we have a captive audience of students, whatever whatever that those caps are, I'm just thinking now we probably do a welcome at some point in the summer prior to prior to the start of classes. So I kind of like that idea actually. I actually have another idea. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in psychoanalytic work, we have a constant called the transitional object. So sometimes, especially when you're working with kids, um, sometimes you give a kid a little gift in a way that um, represents you and represents the therapy 
I, I still do that when I teach kids uh, mindful breathing. I have these glitter sticks that I give them that can watch the glitter go down the stick and they can pick a color and take it home. And it's actually very powerful because you're there in the representation of this object. So, you know, we're so used to using online as a way of communicating that as Professor Yink is saying, we're all getting a bit zoomed out. What if we sent all incoming students a hard copy welcome brochure? Because then it's sitting on their table, it's around, they look at it psychologically, it's a, it's a representation of us, it's a physical thing. And, you know, in my other life as a musician, I can tell you, I, I bemoan the loss of um, vinyl and, and the record jackets and even CDs now. You know, it's like everything's just in the air. And so I used to love to sniff my records, <laughs> you know, the old cardboard, and hold yes. them and look at them. That's more and like, like we don't have to mind, Professor. Like, I know, like, I grew up with my grandfather who had like the, the little vinyl and, I, and they had like, my father had like the whole like Nirvana collection and the Kurt Cobain and in the vinyls and stuff like that. It got, it got destroyed during the earthquake in Haiti, but he did have like all the collection, like the Rolling Stones and all those jazz. Wow. Um, yeah. But the more modern ones, like we're talking like the millennials, I don't think they want like something physical. The only thing that they could like, they might be surprised, Vanessa. They might say, wow, something physical. Like, yes, possibly. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Paper. <laughs> wow. Um, let, me, let me invite other questions because I know we're going to run short on time. So I don't, I just, I don't want to stand in the way if there's someone else uh, who has questions they'd like to ask. We, have, we do have one, another question here from Brittany. Um, oh, excuse me. That one's on tuition, which I'm unfortunately not qualified to answer. Um, but there's one from Victoria saying, I'm, I'm a graduate student and on, honestly petrified about returning to campus. H how do I spend the summer? Um, I, think she, I think she's asking not full of anxiety. Um, or how do I spend the summer if I am full of anxiety? And I think it's a general question of, you know, in light of the findings that so many of you have shared and, and what, it, it, what it signals with respect to the levels of anxiety that frankly, not just our students, I think, are feeling. I, I, you know, I think a lot of the faculty, staff I talk to and I, we can all identify with this. Of, well, gosh, when we get the green light to go back to campus, how, how are we supposed to become comfortable with the idea of being in touch with each other again and being in these spaces together? I don't know if we have the, the expertise for it. No, but... we, we do. Does anybody want to, I mean, I have something to say, but uh, any of my colleagues want to speak first? I mean, you know, some of the stuff I talked about earlier, um, mindful breathing, Qigong is something that I have been practicing for 30 years and teaching people. So basic stuff that calms the nervous system, number one. Number two, reaching out to others who are anxious. And, you know, that we know from tons of research the power of what Irving Yalom talked about as the 11 therapeutic factors of groups. And the first one is universality. You know, when we ran groups in homeless shelters for families, multifamily groups, the, the number one thing they said that was so helpful about it was seeing that they were not alone with all the trauma and the stress. You know, we sat in the basement, we had pizza, and for an hour and a half, people shared their challenges and their coping approaches. So something like that, Victoria, I think is very helpful, reaching out. Um, and I, I, this is a hard thing to say, but I think, I think particularly in the, in the West, um, you know, we have this old psychological concept of locus of control, Julia, Julius Rado, I don't think it was maybe in the 40s or 50s, external versus internal locus of control. This is a time where our sense of control and self-efficacy is greatly reduced. We are scared to death about death, about illness, disruptions of all sorts, economic and otherwise. And there is a certain degree, I think, of being able to, I wouldn't quite call it make peace, but sort of accept a, a reduced level of control. And you control what you can, and the things you can't control, you, you just let it happen. And that sometimes, as I said earlier, for some people may be reaching to their spiritual or religious practices. I think, you know, psychology, psychology was born to some extent 
in contrast to spiritual and religious practices, but there's more and more research on the positive psychological effects of prayer, of religious and spiritual belief, of practices, whether it's Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, whatever. So I think, you know, in talking with my students and family, psychology, and actually I see that one of my star undergrads here uh, is on this call, Sagita Akhtar, who's doing a very interesting honors thesis on Muslim undergraduate students' beliefs and attitudes about mental health, mental illness, and treatment. And I don't know, Sangita, you want to say anything about your study, but, you know, one of the things we're looking at is what does um, Islam say about the things that we in the West typically call uh, mental disorder or psychological difficulties and so forth? And how, how does Islam recommend handling those things. I think it's time that we integrate these things, I and mean, this crisis is an opportunity for that. So, can, I'd like to just chime in, because I think a lot of our conversation right now is about what the students can do to feel better, and I think there's another layer, which is what do we as a school do? Um, and, and from that perspective, you know, there's a few things. One, everybody feels calmer with information. It's across the board. Even when it's not information we want, something knowing some things can help. And knowing it when it's delivered in a clear, concise, organized manner makes a very big difference. So I think institutionally, the more that we communicate with all of our different subpopulations from top all the way down to the students, from the top administration to the faculty, from the faculty department chairs to their, their faculty, you know, e every layer of communication we do where the messages are consistent, where we express that we have a plan of how we're going to reopen and how we're going to do it safely makes people feel like, oh, this is, we have this under control. Somebody's thinking about all the different pieces. They're not just winging it. And that helps calm a lot of nerves off the bat. Um, so I think, so there's that piece, so it's communication. I think the other piece is that as faculty, we can play a big role in creating points of community with the students we work with. So whether it be weekly 30 minute drop in Zoom time, right, where anybody can log in and have time with you just to say hello or for a work question or a class question. But we're basically, we're creating the hallway run-ins in a slightly more organized way over Zoom. And I, again, it helps bridge the feeling of distance and disconnection and that we're not being held. Um, so those are two things that come to mind. And then just to reiterate what Peter said, I think to go through this pandemic and to not feel any emotional distress is weird. So we want people to kind of feel a little angsty. It's letting us know that you're reacting to something and you're not numbing out. You're not dissociating. You're not pretending you're living in another world. So to normalize a little anxiety, a little depression, the ups and downs, the dysregulation is critical. What we want to then be attentive to and help all faculty know how to spot is what does it look like when it's outside the normal range of distress? So again, institutionally, how do we really train faculty to be mindful of students who are in normal levels of distress versus kind of above and beyond? And then directly reaching out, using student affairs, using the wellness center, using all the community organizations around us to then provide buffers and supports for those students to help them through the experience. Um, th those are just some different thoughts that. Asha, thank you. That, those, those, those are very good notes to, to end our conversation on. I wanna be mindful of people's time, but I think this conversation actually is, is an additional contribution, I hope, to um, a public conversation that we all need to be a part of at the college. Um, and so I want to thank everybody for being a part of it, but particularly I want to thank our panelists, Sasha, Peter, Inka, 
Hillary. I want to thank and, and, and make sure everybody knows Celia Lloyd, who's the Vice President of City College for Student Affairs and for Enrollment Management. That, and Celia asked some of the first questions um, and, and plays a, an extraordinarily important leadership role at the college around a lot of these issues. Um, we, we had an event on Tuesday. We had this event today, and, um, and we're going to continue to have events out of the Colin Powell School to talk about these issues around how we are responding as a community to the pandemic. Um, I was in conversation with President Boudreau, and he's interested in engaging members of the Harlem community in, in further conversation. And we have interest among faculty in, in continuing the conversation about the kind of global implications um, of, of the pandemic. But the threads that we picked up on today, I think are gonna be important ones, not for us just to continue a conversation about, but to really figure out some steps in action on so that we can support our students in different ways and in creative ways. And so um, please be in touch with me if you have ideas on those fronts or follow up, please feel free to be in touch with those who are part of the panel. And again, thank you very much for being a part of this. I wish we could applause, but, but, but know that we're clapping for you as our speakers uh, from where we all sit in our homes. So take care, be safe, be well, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.